So we're finishing up a series called Conversations with Jesus. And uh, I want to get right into this. We have communion this morning. So I'm going to, if I'm not done, I'm going to cut it off so we can get into our time of communion. But I'm going to talk fast. You listen fast. And uh, we should be able to pull this out, okay? So we're in Matthew chapter 20. So turn there. We've been having these, this look at this interaction that Christ has with different individuals. Today, we are going to see how Jesus responded to some people who were asking for special treatment. Uh, and we're going to get into this discussion from Matthew chapter 20. So up on the screen, you're going to see some verses. Follow along with it. You just follow along as I read this. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, that is, came up to Christ, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. He said to her, what do you want? She said to him, well, say that these two sons of mine, and we're going to talk about all of this, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They, meaning James and John, the sons, said to him, we are able. And then Christ tells them this. They have no idea, by the way, what they're saying. Then he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father, I love verse 24. And when the ten heard it, the other ten disciples heard the request from James and John, they were ticked off. They were indignant. Pretty strong word in the Greek language. At the two brothers. We'll talk about that. Uh, actually, this story to me is a kick. So um, let's pray again and then we'll continue on. Father, we just want to... Make sure, Lord, I want to make sure that as we look into your word this morning, more than anything, that we honor you from the teaching of the scriptures. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. God, thank you that we can trust this book that we hold in our hands. And I pray, God, that you would bless again our time together. Again, be with the Betker family and watch over them and be with them. Be with each one that is sitting in this room this morning, Lord, that we would be drawn closer to you. We thank you so much for your grace and mercy. For your name we ask it. Amen. All right, grab your outline. Let me get everything. We'll get started. Just some thoughts as we get into place before we get some lessons out of this conversation. Christ has told the disciples three times, at least three times, that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be put to death. He's going to be buried. He's going to rise again, all right? So the two disciples, James and John, think, you know what, if this is true of what's going to happen, they don't, gr they don't grasp any of this, but their thought is, well, if this is going to happen, if Christ is really going to die and raise from the dead, that means he's probably going to usher in his kingdom on earth. So they take advantage of that and think this is a great time to ask Jesus a question. And so that gets us into this conversation. Now, I have no doubt that the mom is a nice lady, okay? Some people think her name is Salome, who's a woman in the Gospels. We can't prove that. But James and John and their mom um, probably are off in the corner talking about that after Jesus has said he's going to die and rise from the dead. And they kind of discuss this and... What I get a kick out of is that James and John are known as the sons of thunder. But in this conversation, they're pretty thunderless. Because they're not the ones that make the request. Mom does. And so this is, you know, mom's looking out for her sons, right? And so I don't have any doubt that she's a very, very nice lady, uh, probably really nice. I'm James and John. The funny thing is, they've been with Christ for about three years by this time. They should know more than anybody that 
they should be able to just go and talk to Christ, right? They've been with him for three years. Holy moly. I noted a few things on your outline. And, you know, there are a lot of nice people. I mean, I've met a lot of nice people, but you have. You guys are all nice people. <laughs> you are, really. Really, I'm not trying to convince you. I really believe that. But I've met nice people that can also be extremely demanding. And they use their niceness, niceness to make demands and expect you to do whatever they ask. And uh, we've all made demands sometimes. We all have our expectations. Some people can be pretty blunt, which can lead to unnecessary tension sometimes. It's not to say that what is asked is wrong, okay? But it does matter how we ask it and how we handle things. It really does. And so when I interact and I read this story, I don't think that the mother of these two disciples has any ill intent. I don't think she's trying to cause issues. I don't think she's trying to stir the pot. She's just looking out for her sons. Okay? So she comes out of respect in verse 20. She does kneel down to Christ. All of this conversation revolves around the fact that back in Matthew 19, 28, Christ had said, those who follow me will sit on 12 thrones judging the tribes of Israel. All right? That's speaking of the disciples. And so I think that when James and John heard that, they started thinking, well, let's see. Yeah, where would I like to sit? If I get a choice to be at the table with Jesus, where am I going to sit? Right? And they want to be on the right hand or the left hand. Those are places of honor in the ancient world. Uh, if there was a host at a party and you were a guest, the person sitting on either side of the host was the honored guest. And so the disciples decide, this is what we want. I want to be next to Jesus. I can't necessarily blame them for that, but it's how everything comes, how everything is handled. I mean, it just isn't going to set well. The brothers are looking for special privilege. That's what they're looking for. And as we're going to see, Christ is going to teach them, and it, some things that I reminded my I had to be reminded of, as I read through the story, he's going to teach me about what real privilege is, and what really matters. So be honest, the timing is bad by the brothers, and the request is wrong. It is. It just is. And you know this, that sometimes encounters can lead to tension. Right? And so we're going to talk about this conversation real quick here and note four things that take place uh, as this thing unfolds, okay? So here's the first thing I want us to look, think about. There are a lot of times when we throw out an idea or a demand and we don't really think through the ramifications of how what we're saying might affect other people, right? I get an idea in my head, this is what I think Oak Ridge should do or this is what I think somebody should do. And so... It's not the idea that it's bad or anything, but sometimes we don't think through how it impacts other people. We don't. We get very tunnel vision in how we're handling things. So many people have great ideas. And sometimes in our push to make those things happen, we don't consider the effect on others. I've done that as a pastor throughout the years. We push, push, push for something because I'm so convinced of it, but I haven't thought through of the effect it would have on the church or other people, and God has had to put me, put the brakes on. Maybe he's had to do it for you. It's not that the ideas are necessarily wrong or bad. So this whole interaction begins in verse 20. We've read it, but let's go back and read it again. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons. Now, James and John are kind of trailing behind their mom, or maybe they're with her. 
Uh, but she is the one that's the main spokesman, I think. But they're all in this together. And uh, kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Now, I want to say something. This same story is found in Mark chapter 10. And in Mark 10, Mark says that this is, according, this is Peter. Mark is writing based on what Peter remembers. Here's what was said. Teacher, now get this. You relate to this. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, have you ever had anybody come up to you and go, will you do something for me? And they won't, and they're expecting you to say yes, but you don't have a clue what it is. You ever had that happen? I have. That's what they do. Lord, now, we're not going to tell you yet what we want, but we want to know that you're going to do, give us the answer that we want. If that's not manipulation, I don't know what is. But now, we're dealing with Jesus, right? I've learned a long time ago, if somebody says to me, hey, I need you to do something for me, will you do it? Before I give you a yes or a no, I want to know what it is. Okay? If, uh, if you have, depending on what it is, I might tell you no. And that's what she does, they do. And in verse 20 of Matthew 20, where it says that she asked Jesus, the Greek is, they asked for themselves. James and John are thinking only of themselves and what they can get out of the future kingdom and where they're going to get to sit with Jesus. They could care less of the ramifications and the bleed over on the other disciples and anybody else this might affect. I just love that. I, lo I have to give them credit for the bluntness. I don't know if I'd have the guts to say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I got a question for you. I want you to do for me something. Just tell me you'll do it. So after he turns me to a, 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 you know, a little pile of charcoal, he'll say, what was that you had in mind, Scott? Christ doesn't give them an okay, whatever you want. He asks a question of them and says, in fact, it's in Mark 2, it says, uh, what do you want me to do for you? And in Matthew 20, 21, he says to her, what do you want? One of the things that you and I need to think about is sometimes when we start and come up with great ideas, or in this case, not such a great idea, <laughs> We need to think about others because I don't know about you, I, get very, I can get very focused on what I want to see accomplished or what I want, and I don't think about is there effects positively or negatively on others. So when even people come to me with ideas, even if it's church or things, I, I think through, okay, how is this going to affect other people? Positively, negatively, what, you know, you have to, you say, well, that's just too much thinking. Actually, it's not. Because if you're involved with other people, like in a church or in a community, family, whatever, decisions do affect other people. They do, whether you want to admit it or not. There's not a, such a thing as lone wolf Christianity. There's not such a thing as, you know, you know that the elder board at Oak Ridge is just up here and we're like dictators and all this. No, not at all. So I have to think through this. They had, not, they had not thought this through at all, and the Greek brings that out. The request was only for the family. That's it. They didn't care about the other ten disciples and how this would affect them at all. They're, they're just thinking about themselves. So just remember that. Not that a request is bad. It's not that it's wrong. But first of all, don't get demanding. Okay? We're not talking about sin issues where we confront sin, but don't be demanding that, man, this is the way it's got to be, and blah, blah, blah. Remember, you can bring something up that doesn't have to come across as, you better do it my way. When I was a youth pastor in Phoenix, there was a guy in our church there that he didn't like the, the, the way the church was headed. And we were a pretty good-sized church, but he didn't like the pastor 
And so he decided to make sure everybody knew he didn't like the pastor. And one of the, not that you do that here, that's not, what I, that's not the point. But he decided, that, and he made it clear that he was going to be very demanding that his way of not liking the pastor, ever others would know about it. So he just went up and told, he told us as a staff, I'm not going to give another dime to this church until this happens. So he held us hostage that way, tried to. And I loved how Pastor Dave, the guy I worked for, handled it. He said, whatever, if you don't want to give to this, that's your decision. But we're going to do what God leads us to do. The point of it is, is we need to be careful. We make statements, we make demands, we make even plans. We don't think about what is the effect on others. In this conversation, Jesus is not only going to teach the mother and James and John some important stuff, but he's going to teach us. Here's the second thing. Wow, look at this. We're rolling. If, if, in, in, or if there's this conversation taking place, if questions are involved, or, yeah, if questions are involved, be prepared to ask or answer questions. Here's what I've learned over the years that one of the ways to handle those potential, what I call, tension moments is to ask questions like, why are you asking that? What is really on your mind? You know, you might have to put it back on them. That's a great idea. Why don't you do something about that? Offer help, so on and so forth, but put it on them. If there's a question that is being asked, be honest in your answers. If somebody is really wanting an answer, and they're seeking, actively, honestly seeking, give them an answer. If you don't know the answer, tell them we'll get it for them. And so as this begins in verse 21, Jesus says, what do you want? Now here's what, to me, and you don't necessarily see it in the English translation, but when it says, she said to them, to him, say, that these two sons of mine will, are to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left, in the kingdom. Whether the Greek word can mean it's a polite request or it's a demand, okay? So she could be politely saying to Jesus, well, you know, Lord, I'd like my sons to sit next to you. Or it could be that she's looking at Jesus saying, this is the way it needs to be. My sons are to sit next to you. Either way, the expectation is that when Jesus lays out the thrones, the 12 thrones, okay, James is on one side and John's on the other side of Christ, on the right hand and the left hand. In other words, when the demand is made, the, or the statement is made by her, the text can't always see it in English, but I think if you read it, you do see it, that there's a demand that he'll do it and the expectation, yes, Lord, you need to do this for me. Now, how many of us really like that kind of in-your-face statements? She wants her sons to be in places of honor. They wanted the places of dignity, and I have no doubt that there's a little bit of pride at play here. Some people just think it's got to be their way. That's the way they are in this. Jesus' response to them is not harsh at all. He informs the brothers, and I love this, they have no idea what they're asking. None. Because if you look, verse 22, you do not know what you are asking. The word no there means you have no concept, you have no knowledge of what you are hoping or asking for. They think this is a cakewalk. Christ will die, raise from the dead, get the kingdom started, we'll get to sit on the thrones. Little do they know at this point of what's ahead for them. Even when people are making demands or you're having these conversations, it can get a little bit tough. We should never be harsh. We need to answer the right way. 
Some people who make things difficult are very one-dimensional, and that's how James and John were. And Christ challenged them with questions. You don't have any idea. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Flip over your notes. There's a third thing I learned from this, and we just said this, but he builds on it. Even when we're dealing with situations like this, we need to be open and gracious. Jesus doesn't necessarily have a problem uh, asking them the question. He, well, he doesn't in verse 22. Notice, are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And here's their response. We are able. They have no idea what the cup is. You know what the cup is? It's the cup of suffering. It's what Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed for God to remove. It's the cup of agony. It's the cup of, and these disciples, they have no idea. They're probably thinking, yeah, good, you know, a good glass of uh, peach tea would be good about now. You know, that's not it at all. They have no clue what they're asking. No clue. Christ doesn't rag on them. He doesn't rake them over the coals. He simply challenges them. He's gracious, but he's firm. You have no idea what you're asking. And the idea is that they haven't grasped anything that he has said. The word no kind of drifts back in their time together. It's like he's saying, of all this time with me, the things that I've taught you, the things that I've warned you about, you haven't understood it yet. You don't know. You have no knowledge of what I'm talking about. He's gracious and he's kind, but he's firm. So he says, and when they say we are able, they have no idea what they're saying. They just, anything, they're going to say anything to get their way, is my opinion. So when Christ says, well, you know, are you able to drink the cup? Oh, yeah, if it gets to sitting on the thrones next to Jesus, yeah, I can drink the cup. And I love what he goes on to tell them. Well, guess what? You will drink the cup. But as far as who sits where, that's not my call. I love that. He just lays out the facts. He's gracious. He's kind. And we need this in conversations. Even if you have somebody who is just so determined that they're going to get what they want and you're kind of hesitant you're not sure it's best we still need to be gracious we still need to be kind we need to make them look at all the angles of what they're saying i remember years ago i had this great idea at our at church in california that we would open a counseling center nothing wrong with opening a counseling center and so i kind of really pushed the idea to the church, we'd open a, it'd be a non-clinical counseling center. We would train people in our church and, and through a particular program called Wise Counsel. And then we would open up our church to people who just wanted to talk and needed help. They would have to sign waivers and all that. We were non-clinical, non-professional. And I remember, man, I was so committed to this idea. I thought it was the greatest. I thought, man, this is probably my brightest moment in history. And the board looked at me and said, no, not now. So I had two choices. I could start into the old pout mode. You, know, <laughs> you don't care about souls. You know, I could have done all of that. Or I could make a better and wiser decision and wait to see what God's timing was or if that was even the best thing. And I chose that way to go. A year later, we talked about it again. We opened the counseling center. But I was glad for people who said to me, you know, it's like me saying, hey, guys, I want to sit at the right hand of Jesus. And they said, no. You have no idea what you're even talking about. They were gracious and they were kind. You see, we need to think things through. Things affect other people. We need to be gracious and kind as we deal with them. We need to interact, ask questions, listen to questions. And in this conversation, what I find fascinating is that, again, they have no idea what is going on. It won't be very long before James will be put to death by Herod in Acts chapter 12. 
And John will live out his days, last days of his life, in exile. Because the Romans feared him so much. And, what, and who he was. They would indeed, you know, drink the cup of suffering. But Jesus reminded them, I have no clue where you're going to sit. I'd have just been this way. I'd have been mean enough to say, you know what, guys? I'm going to put you at the end <laughs> of each side. You get the farthest thrown away. I, that would have been just me being ornery and being my sarcastic self. I'd have said, hey, you guys, I don't want to li- You're whining. James, you're over here farthest I can get you on the right. And John, you're over here farthest I can get you on the left. But no, the Lord just says, that's not my call, guys. You know? We're talking the Son of God who says, hey, that's not my decision. When dealing with people, even if they're pushing their thinking like James and John were, be gracious. We can be so mean sometimes. We can be so rude to each other in our world. I mean, just turn on the news. Oh, my word. We're the ones who need to take the high road with each other even. We're Christians. We need to act like it, right? I say that to myself. Be open and honest. There might be some pushback. James and John, they're not overly excited, I don't think. They're not getting what they want. But there's a fourth and final thing I want us to see. When things, when you're having uh, conversations and people are throwing out their ideas, demands, whatever it is, do you know that sometimes there is fallout? So in, here in Matthew, remember what we read, verse 24 tells us the disciples, the other disciples, when they heard this, were indignant. They were, in the good old English vernacular, ticked off. And here's why I think they were ticked off. They didn't think of the question first. Think, think about it. They're probably going, doggone it, I never thought of that, or... I was going to ask Jesus that, but I, being spiritual, just walking in the Spirit, I wouldn't ask that of Christ. They are torqued. Mark is very clear that the ten other disciples, they go after James and John. It is a verbal assault. (laughs) They're mad. And uh, Jesus didn't sell tickets to the show. He's going to step in and intervene. Managing potential fallout is not always easy because now you've got 12 people. It's 10 against 2, so the odds aren't going well for James and John. And it's very clear that the other 10 disciples were mad. It's not like one of them said, well, those other nine guys, you know, they're really, they're really, you know, weak in their faith and I'm real spiritual, so I'm not getting involved. No, all ten are mad. They've been with Jesus for over three years. And I've been with Christ for over 48, and I still mess up. Do you? And so Jesus kind of looks, I just can see this little, I guess see this little smile across his face as he's watching all of this stuff unfold. And here's what he does. Look at verse 25. Jesus called them to him. He says, fellas, come here. Let's just sit down and have a chat. When Jesus says something, you listen. He goes, listen, guys. You know what's the most important thing? It's not you getting your way. It's not you always getting what you want. He doesn't attack them for their requests, but he does deal with their attitude and why they asked. He says the most important thing in verse 25, and he brings up an illustration. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lords it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. In Rome, the word of the Roman government was final. And they were tyrants in many ways. He says that's how the world lives. But he says, 
that should never be among you. Whoever would be great among you, and this isn't why you do it, that's not what he's saying, must be your servant. That's greatness. It's not sitting in some place of honor. It's not being able to look at a degree on a wall and say, aren't I brilliant? Nothing wrong with degrees, that's not my point. You know what true greatness is? It's serving. It doesn't mean you can't have good ideas. It doesn't mean you shouldn't bring up good ideas, even for the church to consider doing. That's not it at all. And this has nothing to do with, oh, people have been inundating me with ideas. That's not it at all. I have to keep going back to this. Greatness in the eyes of God is a willingness to serve. And so when I'm handling potential issues because people are, you know, at each other and all, the whole thing is to bring everybody back to why are we here? It's not that your idea is wrong. It's not that it's bad. Now, in this case, James and John, I'll just say it, they were wrong. They were wrong. But that doesn't mean every idea is wrong. But the point of it is, Jesus says, you guys are so hung up on position and prestige. He says, God, in God's kingdom, you want greatness? Look for others to serve. Look for others to help. Even when we have to challenge wrong thinking, you know, people aren't always going to agree with you. They didn't always agree with what Jesus had to say. But Colossians 4 tells our speech to be seasoned with salt. It's to be gracious. You know, I don't know what all happened in the end. In fact, there's an indication in another gospel that Things kind of continued on as they're walking down the road. Then they're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. And it's like Jesus has just talked to them. And they still don't get it. So I, I just want to remind us that, you know, in this conversation with Jesus, this, you know, it's really not about me, bu- me building some kingdom on earth as a pastor I just want to serve the Lord and serve you. And, when, and, and it has nothing to do with people bringing up. I mean, people in this church have great ideas, and we've implemented a lot of them. And to do ministry and to help others and to reach out. And there's things that cross my mind. And I think, oh, that'd be cool to do. But God then says, no. Not right now. The point I'm trying to make is that we just need to realize that everything we do as believers does impact other people. Decisions I make, things I say, things I do, it impacts other people. And I want to be great in God's kingdom, not so that I get more crowns, you know, than anybody else where I can boast, you know, and brag about how many I have. And No, you know why we want to be great in God's kingdom? Because when you do that, here's your sole focus. You want to honor and glorify God by serving. And if you don't have a servant's heart, if I don't have a servant's heart, I've missed the boat. I'm not here for myself. You're not here for yourself. You're here for others. It's that simple. The self part is that we grow in our knowledge of Christ and become more like Jesus with the whole concept that we're flowing out to others who we are. That is the Christian life in a nutshell as far as I'm concerned. All right? Let's pray and then we're going to enter into a time of communion. All right? You can find more messages like this one at oakridgebc.org and like us on Facebook for encouragement and event updates right to your newsfeed. Thank you for listening to today's message from Oak Ridge Community Church.